I've always found the title of Cyborg 009 a fascinating choice of naming to represent the franchise. As from title alone, it instantly conveys the scenes and premise of the story itself, all while evoking a mechanical tone. Nine humans against their wills forcibly turn into robot-human hybrids to serve as mere tools for an evil organization bent on taking over the world, only for them to rebel against their captors. Not to mention, the extra zeros before the nine further instill an identity defined by a production number, rather than through personhood or distinguishable traits. With all that said though, its appellation misses out on one of the finest and most defining qualities of the story itself, pertaining to how well constructed this team of nine cyborg soldiers operate as a unit, all of which stems from the series itself assuming the name of the main character for its title, rather than by emphasizing the lead's own group as a whole. And for that reason is why I ultimately called this video Cyborg 009, the most well-balanced team of shonen superheroes. Just so everyone is on the same page, I'll start off by providing a brief summary of each member of this team of cyborgs, beginning with 001, aka Ivan Whiskey, a Russian infant with a genius level intellect who has psychic powers. Such abilities include telekinesis, future sight, and teleportation. Next, Jet Link, also known as 002, an impulsive American male from New York who has rockets implanted into his legs, allowing him to fly. 003, Francois Arnoul, a caring Frenchwoman with heightened senses, such as see-through vision and hearing that can detect activity miles away, or even pick up the lowest of frequencies. 004, Albert Heinrich, a nihilistic East German whose entire body has been constructed into a living weapon, as he can fire bullets from his fingertips, launch a missile from his kneecap, or wield his sharpened hand like a blade. 005, Geronimo Jr., a gentle giant Native American with unmatched strengths and skin as tough as armor. 006, Cheng Changku, a Chinese chef who can breathe fire. 007, Great Britain, nicknamed the Chameleon, a male Shakespearean actor who can transform into anything. 008, Punma, a dark-skinned man from Africa who can breathe underwater, withstand the harshest of depths, and traverse the ocean at lightning speeds. And finally, the titular lead himself, Cyborg 009, aka Joshi Mamora, a mixed-race man from Japan with the power of super speed. With the introductions out of the way, I can move on to breaking down the actual specifics of the group. First off, every cyborg soldier consistently contributed to the story, and their involvement never rubbed off as forced. For example, in a prior video, I criticized the main cast of My Hero Academia, another anime manga superhero team, for having so many characters that the majority of them never really add anything to the story, and oftentimes, when they finally receive their moment, it felt unnecessary to the central plot of the story. For instance, during an arc set in an urban environment, the story randomly inserted a large body of water into the area just to give the aquatic hero something to do, which in the end seemed like an unnatural scenario. Now, Cyborg 009 dodged this issue by limiting its main team to a more manageable nine members, and what made this all the more digestible regard the fact that 001 often fulfilled the role of the armchair general strategist, further reducing their numbers, thus allowing the combatant members even more time to shine. Since I just mentioned how My Hero Academia wrongly used a water-based hero, I'll start off by discussing how Cyborg 009 did it correctly through 008. Where in the story, the main cast usually travels the world via a submarine known as the Dolphin. So because they often spend time in the water, they quite frequently deal with undersea attacks, thus giving the aquatic 008 time to work as magic. In addition to that, many of the Cyborg soldiers' various missions involve infiltrating enemy strongholds, several of which happen to be located on islands in the center of the ocean, which again puts him to realistic scenarios to utilize his abilities. Switching gears, 002's power tackles this subject from the opposite end of the spectrum, where he patrols the skies, and how this series integrates his flying into the story in a natural way, regards the fact that he and his team frequently combat gigantic building-sized robots, leaving him the only one with the capabilities of attacking it from above. Quite often, a weak point of theirs involves the eyes or the head, which from his skill set gives him the best possible chance from among his peers of landing a decisive blow. So with all that said, the author of Cyborg 009, Shotaro Ishinomori, masterfully crafted the story's various environments in a way that the more circumstantial based abilities wouldn't clash with its setting, which prevented sensations of overreach for the sake of plot, and makes the unfolding narratives flow more naturally. Returning to how each cyborg soldier's powers introduce their own unique contributions to the group, continuing with 002. Now, as his rocket-powered feet grant him flight, he can cover great distances, 
allowing him to act as a sort of scout for the group. Like, let's just say a teammate of his got lost in the desert. Well, he can easily traverse this normally harsh terrain and spot them from above. Moving back a number to 001, he can be best described as the team's operator, as through his telekinesis, he can relay messages out to people in the field. Likewise, if they find themselves in a dicey situation, he can warp them back home away from danger. Occasionally, he will participate in combat, but generally only against other psychics. Next, quite often in the story, the team encounters suspicious people that could potentially catch them off guard and cause real damage. But with 003's heightened senses, she can scan them to make sure that they're safe. Like, her x-ray vision can determine if they might harbor a secret weapon, or if they hide behind a false skin. In addition to that, her enhanced hearing detects approaching far-off foes that can't be seen with the naked eye, meaning her abilities can foil sneak attacks and give the team time to prepare for what might ensue. Skipping ahead a member, 005's raw strength aids the group in a multitude of ways. Like on many missions, the team frequently finds their path forward blocked by a heavy-duty door, but with 005's powerful build, he can just brute force his way through so they can continue onwards. Besides that, those same missions generally involve him and his team demolishing enemy strongholds. So as the base collapses, he deals with the debris, and if any friends find themselves trapped underneath a crumbling wall, he can set them free by lifting the rubble off of them. In the first episode of the 1979 anime, 005 even saves the series namesake from being crushed by blocking a kick from a massive stone giant, which in and of itself further solidifies the idea that the story is more than just Cyborg 009. Moving on to 006, who proves his worth by having breath that can melt metal, which comes in handy when invading fortresses consisting of solid steel, or when facing mechanical opponents such as tanks or robots. In addition to burning through metal, 006 often used his flames to tunnel through the ground. Combat-wise, he excels at taking on swarms of enemies, as his breath can blanket the battlefield. His next use may not occur all that often, but if he or the team finds themselves in a cold region, he can easily melt ice or warm everyone up by raising the temperature. Finally, I'll cover the main hero himself, Cyborg009, whose speed allows him to run so quick that he can easily rescue others from oncoming danger, and also, when in combat, moves so fast that almost no one can land a hit on him, so he can act as a distraction to hold up the enemy. With the characters I've mentioned thus far, their abilities fulfill a specific purpose. But with the ones I've omitted, 004 and 007, they more so function as support units to the team. And for why that is, I'll start off with 004. Let me put it like this, each cyborg soldier owns a standard issue laser pistol, which can stop small grunts or henchmen, but not the heavy duty building size robots, which is where 004 comes in, as his kneecap missiles can demolish the more durable foes meaning the main team weakens the target in order to set everything up so 004 can land the finishing blow. On another note, during a mission where he and his team traversed an overgrown jungle, he and 005 cleared the way so everyone else could get through. He wielded his blade hand to cut through vines, while the latter, with his great strength, just ripped apart all the vegetation that stood before him. So even though the former's contribution may not be as specialized, he still assisted the group. Switching to 007, he supports the team through his versatility. Like, if 008 finds himself overwhelmed underwater, 007 could change into, say, something like an octopus, a creature that can survive the harsh depths of the ocean, and help his buddy out by lending him a tentacle or two. Or, if the team requires an extra airborne scout, he can transform into a bird and fly off on his own. Besides that, one could construe 007 as an infiltration expert. Like, to gain access to an enemy base, he assumed the appearance of a guard to sneak inside. Or another time occurred when he uncovered a miniature open air vent, which for a normal human would be too small to crawl inside. But as he could alter his shape and size, he shrunk himself down into the body of a small animal to enter. What I've been leading into with all of this regards how each and every member fulfills a unique purpose within the group, while also simultaneously balancing the team in terms of both importance and even screen time. From all the contributions I've listed for every cyborg soldier, you could actually argue many of them carry a greater significance than even 009, who in every version has been called the most advanced among them, i.e. statistically the best. And because of that is why I consider this series as a near-perfect model to follow when writing stories featuring teams, or even just a large cast in general, as it knows how to equally distribute everything between its cast, so no one feels like a space filler. And now would be as good a time as any to mention that during missions, the story has no fear of leaving some characters at home, even including the lead, just to let everyone have their moment, which also prevents the feeling of overusing certain characters. Since I just covered the topic of how the structure of the story contains such a large cast in a manageable way, 
I thought I would do the same with the more over-the-top abilities, specifically how it doesn't break the world or make one character seem overpowered. To begin, I'll start off with the reality-bending psychic 001. Now, as he can teleport people miles away, read minds, and to a lesser degree predict the future, you'd expect him to be an unstoppable force of nature, but the author, in a conceivable fashion, constructed his character in such a way that he wouldn't insta-win every single battle, because since he possessed the body of a baby, his frail build couldn't handle the massive strain of overusing his broken abilities, which if he attempted, the stress would send him into a near unwakeable 15-day slumber, meaning he couldn't freely utilize his power without a potential risk. On top of that too, the concept of his abilities putting him out of commission also coerced him to be more reluctant in harnessing his might, as if he unleashed his power at an unnecessary point, that could potentially render him unavailable at a time when his team actually needs him. So there's more of an initiative to restrict engagement with foes. What's also worthy of note, regards why it works that 001 can't spam his broken abilities, which arises because of his underdeveloped infant body, and for that reason, his drawbacks seem believable and authentic as babies lack the capacity to withstand extreme pressure in the same way a fully grown adult could. At the same time, despite 001's physical limitations, his adept mastery of everything psychic still remains within the story's own realm of reason. For instance, all the cyborg soldiers received a numerical name by order of assembly. So production-wise, he technically classifies as the oldest, despite his appearance. Tying that back to the main point, as 001 received his cybernetic enhancements earlier than the rest of his companions, that detail alone implies him to have had ample time to master his mental capabilities. Expanding upon that, his mechanical advancements amplified his latent potential, and in some iterations of the story, their retellings build off of that, by saying his cybernetic surgery halted his aging, which even grants him more time to have honed his skills. On a side note, I do have to mention that that aspect creates a fun dynamic within the group, whereby seniority, the oldest and most intelligent member of the group, looks the physical youngest. Switching over to the super speed of 009, which in some versions of the story can accelerate to such a high level that time itself essentially pauses. Now that massive advantage coincides with a disastrous drawback, as at that speed, any slight movement to a non-metallic slash undurable object will instantly incinerate it, which forces 009 to be as cautious as possible. Like if during his time stop he forgets its effects and accidentally interacts with or, innocently enough, tries to help out a normal person, he will indirectly destroy them in the process. The 2001 anime wrote an entire episode dedicated to this very concept, where the device that enabled 009's super speed malfunctioned, which essentially froze time for everyone except himself, and one of the subplots of this story featured him stumbling upon a family caught in the crossfires of an explosion, but he knew an attempt to rescue them by moving them out of the range of the blast radius would just prematurely send them to their demise. Alternatively, in an effort to produce rain to douse the explosion, he punched a hole in a nearby water tank, but because time stood still, the downpour from the ruptured container followed suit. So, he couldn't save them that way either. A good way to summarize how the story prevented time-pausing super speed from becoming overpowered would be by saying that 009 transcending into an all-powerful state inadvertently rendered him powerless, as since he desired to interact with others, his insta-kill touch prevented him from doing so, thus a state of helplessness. Diving deeper into this episode, its plot explored another potential drawback, which admittedly revolves more around this individual story, rather than 009's super speed, and involves the psychological effects from the loneliness of remaining in perpetually paused time. For context, here's how the situation played out. After waking from an upgrade-induced sleep, 009 found himself in a still silent world, 003 standing motionless, Dr. Gilmore, the scientist who modified the team, frozen in the process of writing a letter, Ocean waves locked in place, and a cloth floating in midair, which when touched, burned to a crisp. And after his examination of the situation ended, 009 attempted to deactivate his hyperspeed mode, only for it to fail, leaving the cyborg to wonder if this state would eventually fizzle out, or if it would persist on into eternity. After several presumed months passed, I say presumed because with the flow of time halted, concepts like day and night ceased, so no exact methods of measurement existed. 009 began to lose his mind and question his sanity, like he observed 003's now closed eyes, which he thought were open at the start of his ordeal, leading him to wonder if time had progressed or if he misremembered her appearance, meaning doubt circulated in his head, and that potentially his mind played tricks on him. So a drawback on the prolonged use of super speed involved it distorting its wielder's senses and also inducing a mental toll. 
Overall, this episode examined the side effects and possible risks of possessing a near godlike power, specifically through its impact on the psyche. Returning back to the main point, the story of Cyborg 009 structured itself in such a way that it never felt like the main characters reached a level of strength that they could go unchallenged. But at the same time, the measures included to prevent the more broken abilities from feeling unstoppable didn't appear as contrived, and their presence seemed justifiable. Mentioning this too, even the more grounded abilities possess some sort of limitation. Like 002's rockets required fuel, so he couldn't perpetually fly. Sensory overload could overwhelm 003's senses. And 007's impersonations only worked if his acting skills could convince his target. So, the framework of the series' powers achieved a great balance between strength and realism. With the more individuality-centric subjects out of the way, I'll switch over to discussing the team as a whole. Now, in general, most shonen series featuring a crew, squad, or group have them united under a banner of chasing their dreams. While the cyborg soldiers, on the other hand, consist of individuals stripped of their histories and can no longer pursue their original aspirations, but because of their mutual hardships, they could come together as a team to foil the plans of the Black Ghost, the sinister group that took everything from them. Even beyond that, their cyborg enhancements further disconnect them from their origins, and in a certain sense, humanity itself. In fact, many of the individual narratives that explore one of the group members' backgrounds ends with the death of a person embodying their past, or them permanently severing the bond between their current selves and their old life, meaning no return. Take 009 for example, who came of age in an orphanage with many other children, some of whom got adopted under mysterious circumstances, i.e. by villains, resulting in their mechanization too. And the enemies of the cyborg soldiers used a now grown-up orphan's former friendship with 009 to lure him into a false sense of security in an effort to hunt him down, forcing the series' namesake to defend himself, accidentally causing the destruction of his old pals. So their death further cements the idea that 009 can't return to the way things were. In discussing how one of the members severed ties to the past, I'll mention one of my favorite explorations into a character's backstory from the series through the 1979 version of 002, who in his younger days joined a New York City gang, which oddly enough introduced itself into the story in a way that parodied the musical West Side Story. And during that period, he sustained a severe injury that required a blood transfusion for him to live. And among his friends, only two people possessed a matching blood type, and the person who donated their blood to him happened to be his best friend and future leader of their old gang. Flash forward to the era of which this story takes place, where 002 returned to New York to help out his old associates fight off a rival gang leader. And in their scuffle, the man who had previously donated blood to 002 also received a near-fatal injury that needed a blood transfusion for him to survive. And for old time's sake, 002's friends requested him to lend his own blood to save their leader. But since 002 had been modified into a cyborg, he no longer had the correct blood type for a transfusion. And instead of telling them the truth which could potentially jeopardize their lives, he decided to create the impression that he betrayed them in order to keep them safe and away from danger, meaning he tarnished his own reputation in their eyes by making himself into the villain, to exile himself from what symbolized the old days. Again, cutting all connections to the past. One last backstory to tell in 004, who lost touch with his history even before becoming a cyborg. Now, 004 originated from East Germany, and desired to escape to West Germany with his girlfriend whom he addressed as a future wife. But the government wouldn't permit her to leave, so he concocted a plan to disguise her as a lion and drive across the border with a group of circus animals he had to transport to West Germany. But unfortunately, the guard stationed at the crossing noticed his extra addition and fired upon him, resulting in his girlfriend's demise. Now, because of this tragedy, 004 adopted a more negative and less approachable attitude than the rest of his team, and in most versions of the story, more easily accepts their disconnect from society. Like if a normal human expresses interest in him, he'll have no issues rejecting them. Overall, what makes the cyborg soldiers fascinating isn't their dreams, aspirations, or futures, but instead their pasts and how it led this diverse group of people, all of different heritages, to work together to overcome a common enemy. On a side note, the fact that each member of the team descends from a different part of the world further supplements this idea, as it displays how people can look beyond their physical differences or countries of origin and fight for what is right, regardless of if it's their lane they're defending. For the record, even though both 002 and 005 live in the United States, they still reflect different cultures, as one represents the city life of the East, while the other descends from a Native American bloodline and embodies the spirit of the Wild West. So, same country, but different heritages. 
With that said, now might be the ideal time to discuss one of the most controversial aspects of the franchise in the earliest depictions of 008, which features many negative stereotypes commonly associated with people of sub-Saharan African descent, i.e. thick lips and jet black skin. But first off, I have to say that for my videos, I generally avoid discussing external of story politics or otherwise preachy material in general. In saying that though, I acknowledge that simply ignoring this subject will most likely result in me having to explain myself multiple times in the comments section, so to prevent that, I'll set aside that practice and address this topic now. To begin, one of the first criticisms I read about pertaining to the illustration of 008 involved a comment stating something along the lines of, it's like the author had never seen a black guy before. Well, in responding to that, you can't exactly rule that idea off the table, as Cyborg 009, a Japanese manga, began serialization in 1964, so a country and an era where that possibility exists within the realm of reason, or at least in the sense of close-up encounters. Now, of course, through mediums like cinema, television, magazines, and newspapers, he probably gazed upon someone of that skin tone before, but even then, the question of how high a quality of view he received still persists. Like in that time period, black and white film still dominated most medias. Just a reminder, the 1968 anime adaptation of the series released uncolored. And let me say that black and white film, depending on the lighting, can really distort shading. Like lights can become lighter, and darks can appear much darker. Plus, not to mention the elephant in the room, in that era, Hollywood didn't exactly go out of its way to spotlight representation. So actors of color would most likely be relegated to smaller roles in the back. Now, some independent films were more willing, but even then, that still would be considered a rarity, and also, since this is Japan we're talking about, screenings of independent films most likely wouldn't have been commonplace either. So again, the era and location suggest that Shotaro Ishinomori may not have had the ideal model for 008. In all honesty, since he assumed the profession of an illustrator, it's likely his greatest exposure to characters of African descent would have been the old-time cartoons that portrayed them in not positive fashions. What I'm getting at is, I don't think Shotaro Ishinomori even realized the negative connotations of his design for 008, much less intended to insult anyone with it. And instead, this is just him implementing the art style of his influences into his own work. Remember how I said 002's entrance mimic West Side Story? Like to me, 007 resembles many of the old-time Disney villains, and Dr. Gilmore with his short stature, beard, and bulbous nose looks like he could have been the eighth dwarf in Snow White. Switching over to the notoriously designed character himself, now, even though his appearance follows controversial characteristics, his presence, personality, and role within the story don't. For example, even though he may possess a different skin tone than the rest of his comrades, they don't treat him any differently than they would a light-skinned character. In fact, other than the 1966 movie and the uncolored 1968 anime, the entire team wear identical uniforms to each other, which implies equality among the team. And even in those two, only 009 the leader and 003 the female dress any differently. So 008 still matches members 1, 2, and 4 through 7, meaning that even if he ranks below 009, he still resides at the same level as everyone else. Also, even if people find themselves offended and perceive his outward appearance as negative, in terms of deeds, intelligence, and as a person, the story portrayed 008 as positive representation. Like he valued his heritage and background, he contemplated about how his cyborg modifications prevented him from ever having kids. In general, reflection equates signs of high intellect. He could fend for himself on land, so he could contribute to the group outside of his own specialty. And above all else, he stood as a competent person. Like, if the story depicted him as comedic relief, that could be interpreted as a negative. But since it treated him as a serious character, that's definitely positive. In addition to that, the story directly espouses themes of people over borders or similar physical characteristics. The fact that the team consists entirely of people of different backgrounds and nationalities further proves this. And 008 openly called humanity's entirety brothers. So from those aspects alone, one can easily deduce that the story of Cyborg 009 didn't use the physical appearance of 008 to demean anyone or group of people. Next, one of the major reasons of why many might find caricatures akin to the design of 008 as controversial revolves around the fact that they often fulfill positions of servitude to a master, or the story presents them as uncivilized, therefore unintelligent. But Cyborg 009 doesn't abide by that trend, as it features scientists with the exact same skin complexion and physical characteristics as 008. So having a character like that in such a high position symbolizes them as intelligent, therefore civilized. The series broke this pattern at an even deeper level through the manga-exclusive character of Dr. Uranus, who worked under an evil enemy organization producing cyborg variants of the Greek gods 
in an effort to conquer the globe and capture all the cyborg soldiers. How he specifically defied this established stereotype regards how among his fellow peers, he first questioned their ethics and asked if they had gone too far. At a later point, he even saves a few of the cyborg soldiers from destruction. So from questioning the motives of the group, he proved himself an independent thinker, and his betrayal of his fellow scientists by assisting the protagonists displayed how he alone controls his actions. All in all, both of these aspects indicate how he doesn't fit the mold of a servant. So the exteriors of 008 and Dr. Uranus may have followed some negative practices, but their characters, what's internal, didn't. To conclude this argument, I have to say, if by today's sensibilities you call the design of 008 outdated, fine, I can accept that. But I do have to say, I believe it harbored no ill intentions, and it instead attempted to unify people, regardless of race, creed, or color. And lastly, I have to say, if Shotaro Ishinomori desired to belittle or make any specific population look better than the other, he probably wouldn't have had his home country's lone representative on this team of cyborg soldiers, played by a man of mixed race in 009. Returning to the team itself, one of their best qualities involves their chemistry between each other, and how it further fleshes out their characters. For instance, due to 001 inhabiting the body of an infant, he can't take care of himself, and because of that, 003 often tends to his needs, which establishes her as motherly. With 002's impulsive nature, especially in the anime adaptations, he can often annoy or conflict with his teammates. Like in a dream sequence from the manga, for his enjoyment, he turned on loud music, not realizing that it bothered 008. Frequently, in the 2001 version of the story, on missions, when the rest of the group wishes to stay back and formulate a plan, he criticized them for their hesitancy. Like one time, he mocked 004 for being too slow to eliminate a more ambiguously natured opponent. Because of his impulsivity, he possesses a more competitive attitude, which manifests in rivalries, especially with 009, essentially since they both classify as the cool young guys known for their speed in the group. Like in the 79 anime, one of its opening sequences featured him car racing 009, which displays how he constantly tries to prove himself the better. Now, because of his competitiveness, that leads him to create almost brotherly bonds with others. Like in the 2001 anime, he encountered a young alien that he saw a bit of himself in, as it struggled to stand up for themselves, provoking 002 to get angry at them, but in a more motivational way that would inspire them to fend for themselves. And another time included the conclusion of the first part of the manga, also the end of the 2001 anime, where he flew into space in a likely-to-fail endeavor to save 009, who had been trapped in a rocket ship, which displays how even though he may be competitive, he does indeed care for him, in a sibling sort of way. With 003, she can commonly be seen clinging to the arms of 009, which has led many to joke about them being a couple, which they kind of are but won't publicly admit. Though, I might add, in her mind, she in full detail fantasized about having a kid with him. On to 004. Now, as a quiet member of the group, he rarely interacts with others, but when he does, it contains real value. For instance, in the 79 anime, the team performed a mission in a humble mountain village, whose residents had been hypnotized by the cyborgs at the time enemy. And after completing a task, a brainwashed young girl who'd been previously kind to the team approached them, and they noticed that she'd been set to explode, which they realized they could not disarm before it would go off, so they recognized they had to strike her down before it detonated. Now, 009 prepared to do the duty himself, but 004 stepped in and said something along the lines of, you're too good a person, let me do it instead. And he promptly took her down in place of 009. Now that action means that 004 sees a goodness or a purity in the hearts of his friends, ones that he lacks because of his past history and current self. So he strives to protect that in them by assuming the tainted or dirty work that could corrupt oneself. On a side note, one time during a battle, when 009's laser gun ran out of juice, 004 offered his junior his own weapon, and resorted to using his bullet-firing fingers so 009 could continue the fight. I mention this scene because it excellently demonstrates how if one teammate falls, the others pick up the slack to aid the downed member. For 005, I again return to the 1979 anime. Not necessarily for him, but since I see this scene as emblematic of the team's synchronization together, where, in order to save his kidnapped with his neck in the noose adoptive father, 005 had to duel 009 to appease the captors, leading the silent giant to charge at his friend and engage in a one-on-one -on -one brawl. And after a few blows, the mighty 005 threw 009, but in the direction of his father, so the series' namesake could free him. Why I mentioned this scene involves how, without even conversing to each other, the two teammates knew what the other planned, which displays that they operate on the same wavelength and possess great cooperational skills, while at the same time emphasizing the theme of what makes the team strong isn't them as individuals, 
but what they create when they work together. Lastly, I'll focus on 006, who cooks for the crew, which allows him to have a more unusual relationship with the team. For instance, he owns a restaurant in Tokyo, so the members stationed in Japan often visit him. Like the display 007 can often be spotted at his establishment, hanging out with him after hours, implying them to be closer friends with each other than with the rest of the group. And on top of that, they both occupy more comedic-centric roles within the team. So, in humorous moments, they can play off of each other. Also, with 003 residing in the same country as him, he actually coerced her to briefly work at his restaurant and reluctantly wear a Chinese dress. Which at first embarrassed her, but because 009 liked the look, she ended up enjoying. Elaborating on that, because of his unusual humor-oriented person, he can make old characters act in new ways by getting them to express different sides of themselves. Basically, he creates a scenario where a serious character has to act in an unserious manner. With all that said, what makes the team work isn't how well they perform as individuals, but how they operate as a unit, such as one member filling the holes of an area where another might be weak, or simply from how well their interactions mesh with one another's. Transitioning into the next topic, about how the powers, purposes, backgrounds, and attributes of each cyborg soldier mesh well with their character's personality, or even in some cases, thematically reflect their identity or story arc. Let me put it like this. 002's modifications rocket him headfirst into battle, which aligns with his impulsive shoot-first-ask-questions-later mentality. Even this, his most notable physical feature, would be his long nose, which resembles the beak of a bird, a creature known for flying, his power. So his appearance slash design plays off his ability. And for 007, prior to his cybernetic surgery, lives the life of an actor, a profession where one pretends to be someone other than themselves, which fits for how he later gains the ability to alter his appearance. So, quite literally, become someone else. And those examples only scratched the surface when compared to, say, 004 or 009. Elaborating on the former, who refers to himself as a living weapon and also possesses the most mechanical body from among his circle. Now, how that ties into his character revolves around the fact that he perceives himself as more robot than man, such as how he assumes the more cold, inhumane jobs, objectives where normal warm-blooded humans would be more apprehensive in performing. Other attributes of his person has him declining the advances of friendship from people he conceives as normal, and he also has a tendency of cracking cynical or scathing jokes that commonly offend others. His background plays into his lack of humanity, too, as you could say the human inside of him died alongside his soon-to-be wife, meaning he transformed into a lifeless robot long before he became a cyborg. Overall, you could summarize his character by saying his robotic body reflects his lifeless nature, as they both lost what made them human. In mentioning this, too, the 2001 anime tackled his character from a different angle, where he still retained his humanity but struggled in maintaining it. Like in one episode, he faced an android copy of himself, with the same living weapon body of his, but with the brain of a more analytical but soulless supercomputer, which thematically reflected the battle raging on in his head on whether to embrace the mechanical half, the perceived more efficient side, or the human in him. Switching to 009 and how his identity embodies many of the series' core themes. As stated earlier, his background consists of mixed heritages, a Japanese mother, and presumably a white American father stationed in Japan during or after the events of World War II. Now, that alone serves as a microcosm for the premise of the story, as it symbolizes people of different nationalities looking beyond their borders and coming together. Besides all that, the duality of the titular lead's ancestry represents another theme of the franchise, through the concept of cyborgs, humans with robotic enhancements or features, a la part man, part machine. So again, the concept itself emphasizes the idea of a person stuck between two worlds. Also, because the person of 009 teeters between two borders, he often acts as a unifier, as he frequently tries to befriend or redeem his enemies, and sometimes even helps his own team overcome their own biases by seeing the good in their opponents. Just how the story highlights the difficulty of cyborgs reintegrating back into society, such as with 002's inability to donate blood, or 008's grief over the realization that he'll never continue his bloodline, the tales of 009's history do the same for him struggling in a country where he only shares half their racial makeup. Like during his younger days, he found himself ostracized by the land of his birth, which led him to live the life of a delinquent, culminating in him spending time in jail. So overall, the story's portrayal of cyborgs relates to people of mixed backgrounds, or even those shunned by society. With all that said, the characters of Cyborg 009, through their powers, backgrounds, or attributes, embody the deeper themes of the story, whether it reflects the character's specific mentalities or civilization itself. 
Up next, a recurring trend of the franchise, where the heroes have to battle against the personifications of deities from various old world pantheons, and how that, especially in the anime, examines the question of what power means, or why certain people are considered better than others. To begin, I have to spoil the conclusions of many of these arcs by revealing that these entities are gods in name only, as on most occasions, the plot reveals them to be cyborgs or robots molding the image of a deity, which they themselves might not even realize. Like one instance from the 79 anime, featured 007 blowing his fire breath on a so-called god, which melted away their external layer of skin to unveil a robotic skeleton underneath thus exposing them as a lowly product of man rather than a being of divine origin. Now, the stories of the 1979 and 2001 anime use this concept to set up themes of superiority complexes, or the ego, and that they manifest from manufactured perceptions instead of some innate quality. Like in the 2001 anime, the team fought the Greek gods, referred to as the Miso Cyborgs, who consisted of humans turned into superpowered cyborgs that had their mind and former memories wiped, and were convinced by their creators that they were the real deities of ancient Greece causing them to see themselves as above everyone else. So with this idea, Cyborg 009 presented the concept that hierarchies like class and status primarily exist from artificial or societal constructs, and that any human, within reason, could possibly fulfill the same roles as these gods if they received the same modifications too. What also deserves a mention involves the fact that the Miso Cyborgs believe they should rule over existence, because they think they transcended humans by possessing superpowers, relatively immune to emotion, and that their survival continues on without harming nature. But at the end of the day, a key element in their downfall regards as they couldn't escape their own humanity. Like their central creator, Dr. Gaia, believed erasing their memories would suppress their emotions, which would allow them to become the ultimate super warriors, as nothing would hold them back on the battlefield, something like a sense of guilt or a conscience. Now, even though science locked away the Miso Cyborg's pasts, it couldn't steal away the ineradicable desire to bond with others, such as how their leader, Apollo, inherently valued the life of his sister, Artemis. And when she disobeyed Dr. Gaia's orders, he took her life, which enraged the cyborg leader, provoking him to claim revenge on his creator by killing him. And afterwards, he lost his will to live due to a feeling of emptiness, causing him to not even care about an exploding laboratory about to consume him. I do have to mention, Apollo's learning of his human origins also weighed heavily on him. So the feelings he denied ultimately brought him down, because even though he could pretend they didn't exist, he couldn't hide their effects, meaning the cyborg couldn't transcend the human in him. Continuing on, I'll discuss a later portion of the story dealing with the presence of gods in the manga's iteration of the Edda arc. Just so everyone is on the same page, the Edda is a multi-version encyclopedia, cataloging all the various tales of Norse mythology, and Cyborg 009's arc of the same name creates a story and world that loosely follows Norse mythology itself rather than just conceiving characters based on its figures, like it did with the earlier Greek Miso cyborgs. Now, in Norse mythology, its universe essentially began when Odin slayed the giant Ymir, which essentially birthed the world. From his corpse's hair sprang the trees, and his flowing blood filled the seas. So a tale of destruction seeding rebirth. Also within this pantheon resided a massive ash tree known as Yggdrasil, which connected all the various realms of Norse mythology which also served as a meeting place for all the Nordic gods, or at least in most interpretations in this mythos. Now, Cyborg 009 played upon these aspects in creating a land known as the Mistletoe Village, where in its past once stood an advanced civilization, which managed to produce devastating nuclear weapons that ultimately led to its destruction. But from those ruins, mutated survivors sprang up and founded the city. So again, this concept follows the theme of death sparking new life. Two major features define this town, a thick fog surrounding its perimeter which emitted nuclear radiation, making the area difficult to enter or leave, and secondly, towering above the village rested a titanic tree, which I might add suspiciously resembles a mushroom cloud, and the paneling of this arc's third chapter further hints at this idea. As the first image displayed on page 1 happens to be a mushroom cloud, which in the following panels transitions the focal point to this tree. Again, I repeat, destruction equals rebirth. Switching gears, the secondary premise of this arc observed a woman called Freya, aptly named after a prominent goddess of Norse mythology, attempting to flee the village. But the town's authority figures, who also bore names of Norse deities, forbid her from doing so, and would eliminate anyone that aided in her endeavor. On a macro scale, this narrative thematically represents a person trying to assume godhood, or at least create the illusion of it, by manipulating a near otherworldly domain isolated from the rest of normal society into their own personal paradise. By the way, I also previously neglected to mention that several of these authorities are actually one man, a mad time-traveling scientist from the future playing multiple roles, 
and the parts he doesn't fulfill consist of robots acting under his command who enforce his rules, so he possesses a near total control of this population. Even this, since he owns a time machine, time follows his orders too. The dialogue of this arc even remarked that this land combines the past, present, and future, which also happens to be the translated chapter titles of this mini-arc, as a man from the future manipulated the past to form the present. By the way, the mistletoe village's Yggdrasil tree housed a mad scientist time machine. So the tree of Norse mythology that linked all the realms together in the world of Cyborg 009 bridged the three eras. Overall, the Edda arc explores a man trying to transcend humanity, not by modifying his body, but by replicating a world that belongs to gods, beings beyond humanity, to construct his own obedient domain. With these past two topics completed, I'll pivot to the final way of how the series tackles the subject of deities, pertaining to what constitutes a god. For instance, the idea of modifying the human body with robotic enhancements alone could be construed as playing god, as it uses science to defy the laws of nature. But the story even dives deeper than that. As in the Angel's Ark, the heroes encountered angelic beings with supernatural abilities far exceeding their own, and they also referred to themselves as the creators of man, but acknowledge they didn't comprehend the term god. And those winged beings desire to end and restart humanity, as they'd become dissatisfied with it. Overwhelmed by their otherworldly foes, the cyborg soldiers weighed their options. If they should fight a losing battle, or accept the will of their mind-reading, near-omnipotent, god-resembling opponents who presumably know what's best for the world, and let what happens happen. This even led to some insightful discussion on the nature of God amongst the team. Like 004 commented how the angels wished to rebuild mankind by modifying it into a more perfect image, and followed up by saying that wasn't any different than the black ghost who had modified normal humans into cyborgs. So he suggested they clash with their divine creators, as they had already done so with their scientific ones. From 004's statement, this raises themes of free will, or how long can the creators control their creations in the story. Also, the appearances of the angels coincide with sightings of flying saucers, implying them to have originated from a hyper-futuristic alien society. Which led 002 to remark that humans to angels equates livestock to humans, so basically less intelligent creatures groomed to satiate higher beings. Another part of this conversation broke down the term god and labeled it as an arbitrary term coined by mankind to view themselves as lesser beings to what they consider a higher power. So this talk didn't deny the angels as more powerful, or even as their creators, but acknowledged that referring to their enemies as gods just dehumanized and devalued themselves in the end. In saying that, I believe this is a good way to conclude this segment, by summarizing the overarching theme of Cyborg 009, which can be described as, in the era of rapidly advancing technology, mankind through science performed a level of feats that were previously thought to have only been capable from forces of nature, or as what you might refer to as an act of God, which had allowed for people to lose touch with humanity and see themselves as something greater. But the story of Cyborg 009 tries to remind everyone that at the most basic level, the human element still has worth and should not ever be perceived as obsolete. Moving on, I want to discuss the evolution of the manga. As stated earlier, Cyborg 009 began in the mid-60s and ran till about the mid-80s, but in saying that, the series release schedule didn't follow the typical pattern of a new chapter available every week, and instead, sometimes took years-long breaks in between arcs, which resulted in two things for the franchise. Firstly, that the series of Cyborg 009 consisted of several independent stories rather than focusing on one major plotline. And secondly, it exemplified how Shotaro Ishinomori evolved as a storyteller and as a person over time. And that's the subject I wish to cover for this topic. Now, when the manga began, it started very much akin to say something like Astro Boy, mustache-twirling villains with clear-as-day motivations that served a specific purpose, such as world domination or hunting down the cyborg soldiers. So the plot directly involves protagonists. But as the story progressed, it became more abstract, experimental, and psychological, and featured more ambiguous antagonists, through both intentions and appearance. To explain this, I'll provide an example from an older portion of the story versus one from the later end, both of which best embody their eras. To begin, immediately after escaping the clutches of the Black Ghosts, the cyborg soldiers found themselves targeted by the organization's newer models in 0010 Plus and 0010 Minus, who physically confronted the team with their powers of electricity and super speed, forcing them into several life or death struggles and ultimately resulted in the protagonists indirectly destroying their pursuers. 
With that said, on to a chapter from the back end of the manga, titled The Green Hole, where the cyborg soldiers decided to investigate a massive hole in the planet and found themselves confronted by primitive ape men who followed the orders of a mysterious psychic woman that later brainwashed a majority of the team and took 005 referring to him as her lover, which transformed this investigation into a rescue mission. Once 009 liberated the team, she sent 005 to fight on her behalf, but shortly afterwards began to wither away from the strain of using her powers, thus allowing the cyborgs time to escape, which led her to blow up her home base along with herself in it in an effort to take out the fleeing team. Now afterwards, the semi-conscious 005 began to recite some of her memories she implanted in his mind, stating that a long time ago, she escaped an endangered alien planet and took refuge on Earth, while also mentioning that he resembled her dead lover, and that if her species utilizes their psychic powers, they age, unless they tan under a green light native to her planet, or a variant from a machine that can only mildly suppress the symptoms. In comparison, the recent example's narrative started off by having the team randomly stumble upon a mysterious unfolding event that they didn't even comprehend, which led to them winding up on the antagonist's bad side. Whereas with the one from earlier in the story, its conflict directly engaged the protagonists, and it spawned from their past actions. So the heroes knew what was going on and understood why it occurred, since it involves them. Basically, they fled from the bad guys, who in response placed targets on their backs. What makes these two situations different from each other regards the setup. For instance, in the battle against the 0010s, the circumstance clearly defines the good guys from the bad guys, while in the Green Hole chapter, right from wrong isn't as black and white. Like, the female alien psychic may not be perfectly innocent, since she kidnapped 005 and tried to kill the team in the end, but she doesn't harbor any sinister intentions in the same way as the Black Ghost organization or the 0010s did. Let me put it like this. 009 and his friends disturbed the home she resided at for presumably longer than they've been alive. The existence of the primitive ape men implies this. So if anything, her actions can be justified as self-defense. Since the protagonist technically instigated the situation, so even if they didn't intend to do so, they're not perfectly in the right either. Expanding upon that, during their scuffle, 009 accidentally, and without knowing the effects, destroyed the green light machine, which preserved her life, in essence, killing her, or at least dooming her to death. And that action serves as the catalyst to what provoked her assault against the team. So they more so wronged her than she wronged them which excuses her behavior all the more, especially since she has no idea who they were or what they stood for. On top of that too, the psychic woman's tragic backstory paints her in a more sympathetic light as well. With all that said though, I do admit, many of the early Cyborg 009 antagonists possess at least one redeemable quality to themselves, something like a love of a sibling, which for the record the 0010s have. But even then, rarely did any case ever reach the level of the later chapters. So even though the story always somewhat explored the human side of villains, as it continued, it examined deeper and more morally complex scenarios that raised the bar further and further. Up next, I'll elaborate on how the series employed more experimental techniques of storytelling in the later chapters. For starters, one type involved illustrating manga panels in reverse order. By the way, I have to mention I know manga reads right to left but in this case, reading it in that manner tells the story from ending to beginning. Now, this practice first occurred during an artificially induced hallucination sequence that made its target experience one of their deepest, darkest, most narcissistic desires hidden away in the recesses of their mind. For this example, I use 006's, whose began as him pocketing a large sum of cash, followed by the view of an open safe storing lots of money, after that, a flame burning through that exact same safe, and finally, 006 standing next to that safe while looking in both directions suspiciously. Just so everyone understands the sequence, 006 used his fire breath to melt through the safe and steal the cash for himself. Other than being a neat inclusion itself, its use in this story meshes well with the thematic nature of the arc it occurred in, which asked a question of, at its core, is mankind evil? So the concept of pulling off the superficial layers of mankind to reveal what's underneath functions well with the idea of writing scenes backwards as they both begin with the result and conclude with the learning of the motive. Another manner in how the manga expressed more experimental storytelling involved how later arcs ventured into psychological or even metaphysical territory, where entire chapters could focus on someone reflecting on an idea or question. One instance featured 009 pondering on the nature of souls, while depicting him standing in front of visually stunning, almost ethereal-looking landmarks, such as the Easter Island heads or the Sphinx. Another case exhibited 001 teaching 009 about the spirit which began with the latter falling through an empty black nothingness, only to spot a source of light, which causes the colors to invert and turn to a cellular-like structure, and finally end with him descending into his own shadowy silhouette. 
What I'm getting at is, Cyborg 009 adapting a more experimental style allowed for increasingly expressionalistic imagery that could better communicate through emotion rather than language, which could greater emphasize the new psychological angle of the story. One of the stark differences between the beginning of the story and its end revolves around how the later arcs assumed a parable-like structure that could be contained within a minimal amount of chapters and focused on life lessons through more character-driven narratives. Now, the older arcs obviously carried a message, but they primarily centered on story-driven narratives, which didn't allow for as much flexibility in what they could discuss. As one of the team has to evade, capture, or save the world, they had to follow a set path, but after the team had liberated themselves from their creators, the story could cover any out of their subject it wished to without having the fear of deviating too far off course. With all that said, I think it's time to break down one of those life lesson teaching late game parable arcs in The City of Wind, which began after one of 007's old explorer friends disappeared in South America on a quest to find a lost city of gold, leading the team to take a trip in search of the missing person. While combing the area the man seemingly disappeared in, 009 uncovered a pyramid in a location that had been previously unoccupied hours earlier, and encountered a mechanical but humanoid looking priestess, who said she belonged to an ancient civilization that stored all their gold into structure behind her, while also revealing that to protect their valuables, her people built the pyramid in such a way that it could teleport out of existence. To prevent potential lootings, by the way, the artwork of the story also somewhat implies that the pyramid's disappearance and reappearance might tie into how the wind blows. Keep in mind, wind often serves as a motif for something that comes and goes. The priestess also said that the ancient civilization selected her, along with a gigantic non-humanoid defense robot, to serve as the pyramid's guardians, a role which she fulfilled for centuries, sending the woman to the deepest pits of loneliness, and caused her to beg 009 to stay by her side. Sensing something afoot, the defensive guardian attacked the cyborg soldiers, whom it perceived as intruders attempting to steal the kingdom's treasures. And during the clash, it accidentally struck and killed its female co-guardian who tried to protect 009, prompting the team to fight back and destroy it, which warped the now trashed guardian alongside the pyramid out of existence. After the chaos, the team commented on the ethics of forcing someone into a life of total solitude. Like even though the priestess may have been a robot, she still displayed human emotion, meaning the act itself resembled sending a normal person. With these parable arcs, though their time may be brief, they almost always present intriguing open-to-interpretation situations that'll keep you reflecting on them. Like I view City of Wind as a microcosm for the phrase, you don't own your possessions, they own you. As to preserve one's own valuables, someone else had to sacrifice themselves by exiling from a world they desired to live in, so possessions quite literally entrap their guardians. Another message of the City of Wind, involved how evil, or more accurately said bad, doesn't exclusively originate from malevolence, but also from seemingly innocent actions. For example, if this arc requires an enemy, the antagonist would have to be a presumably now extinct civilization that never even appeared on screen, who justifiably wished to protect their possessions from invaders, which isn't necessarily wrong. Like, even if you consider them evil for the sake of greediness, then the supposed victims of this arc, the explorers seeking to claim the civilization's gold, are just as guilty, since their objectives technically classify as grave robbing for one's own personal gain. Obviously, one can call out the ancient people for causing undue trauma on the robotic priestess, but at the same time, they probably didn't anticipate a machine's AI to develop in such a way that it would resemble human emotions. Like, to perform this duty, they most likely chose a mechanical entity because they thought it wouldn't suffer, unlike a human. After her demise, 007 even commented, who cares, she was a robot, which as an inclusion presumably reflects the sentiments of her creators too. And not until the Between Two Worlds 009 spoke up and reminded everyone how Zaya's cyborgs differed very little from her, and that from the eyes of normal people, they would probably be viewed as similar, did 007 even realize the error of his thinking which again signifies how someone can do something bad without harboring evil intentions, as ignorance led to unintentional cruelty. So, the more character-driven arcs opened up room for the story to explore non-protagonist viewpoints, which in the end could deepen a seemingly shallow character. Like the addition of a tragic backstory could arouse sympathy for a villain, or looking through the lens of another party might highlight how the heroes possess their own flaws too. Again, I have to say, the irregularly structured parable-styled arcs allowed for Cyborg 009 to portray more morally complex and philosophically driven short stories that could prove difficult to cover in, say, a more focused, long-running, story-driven narrative. With this franchise spanning over a half-century and spreading across multiple films, anime adaptations, crossovers, radio plays, American graphic novels, and even a manga continuation based off the posthumously released notes of Shotaro Ishii no Mori, 
I thought it would be good to briefly express my thoughts on the more significant entries of the Cyborg 009 franchise, beginning with the 1968 anime. First off, I have to say this adaptation dropped the ball in several areas most of which I believe stem from deviation from the source material in an attempt to replicate other popular series of the time. One such instance would be how this version completely centered around 009. Like, each story pretty much established him as better than the rest of the team combined, and the only times he really required assistance would have been when the enemies outnumbered him, but on most missions he essentially solved everything himself. Plus, this series boosted his stats so high that his feats could match his other teammates' powers, which lessened everyone else's significance and made them feel unnecessary. In addition to that, I remind you that in this iteration, 009 wore different uniforms than the rest of the team, which paints the picture of him as the leader. So, not an equal, but above them. And that further proves my point. With that extra context added though, I want to rephrase my initial opening and say, I think this entry dropped the ball at capturing the spirit of Cyborg 009, but it didn't aim to do so, and instead, it tried to do its own thing, which it somewhat accomplished. Like this version tries to present 009 as leaderly, and sure enough, if you watch it, you will see him as leaderly. Moving on, another grievance of mine with the 1968 anime, regarding how episode 1, and the rest of the series for that matter, began during the episodic middle of the story. For the record, this version adapted some earlier stories, but not often. As an entry point, this really confuses everything. Like, because it started so late into the series, it skipped over necessary exposition to establish a premise. And even later on, it didn't provide context into the backgrounds of the protagonists, making them feel like they don't have an identity or a history. So if you're unfamiliar to the franchise, you wouldn't understand who or what they are. On top of that too, due to the episodic villain of the week nature of that part of the story, the team can feel purposeless, like they don't have anything greater to do than to fight the person currently in front of them. Picking the middle of the story for the starting point created another issue, as at that place in time, half the cyborg soldiers split up and went their own ways, which projected two major problems. Firstly, that the story consistently reuses the same characters over and over again, making them and their antics feel redundant. I also need to mention that two of these members happen to be 006 and a regress back to a kid version of 007, both of whom fulfill comedic relief roles in the greater story, meaning this section can lack seriousness and feel excessively lighthearted. And secondly, with the group split up, many characters feel underutilized, ones I personally consider to be the more interesting members of the team. For instance, it takes several episodes for those other characters to finally debut in the anime, and after that point, they don't stay with the crew, they return home, so their appearances can feel far and few between. Despite this series' poor structure, I'll say many episodes can be entertaining when viewed as individual narratives contained within a single one-off story. Like, even though they may lack an overarching plot tying them all together, one lone episode can set up an intriguing conflict and successfully resolve it within a 25-minute period, all while presenting a greater message. On a more positive note, the greatest selling point of the 68 anime would be its charm. Like, one lone episode featured the team fighting an army of penguins, a hostage making a getaway in an oversized baby carriage, and 007 transforming into a cute-looking polar bear to ward off enemy soldiers with a club. All of this wackiness plus the more child-friendly designs, I believe would have amused the kids of the 60s. But at the same time, despite its appearance, this series didn't fear tackling tough subjects and wouldn't sugarcoat it when it did. Like, it'll allow a cute little critter to die, and because of that, when it does happen, it leaves a greater impact than with more adult designs. So, the series expertly used juxtaposition to its advantage. Overall, as an anime, I see Cyborg 009 1968 as a series stuck between worlds. Like, it remains inauthentic to the source material, which will drive away the more serious fans. But at the same time, it struggles as a standalone product, because it starts at the middle of the story and never establishes the background of the characters. So, those who haven't read the original manga won't have anything to latch on to. With that said though, this version did have an audience. Not the fans of the franchise, but instead, kids, as they wouldn't care about origins or a greater plotline. But instead, they more so watch it for the fun of the moment. Now, I said had an audience for a reason. As with its colorless retro aesthetic, the series won't appeal to modern youth. So, in that sense, I view this version as outdated and having lost its primary demographic. Meaning that unless you consume anything Cyborg 009, or specifically like old black and white anime, you probably won't be interested in this series. Skipping ahead to the 2001 anime, the version that most closely resembles the original manga, but does take several liberties in its interpretation, which in my opinion mostly pays off. What stands apart in this iteration from the other adaptations regards where its story opened up, which occurred at almost the beginning of the original manga as episode 1 started after 009's cybernetic surgery, only omitting slash relocating the origins of the other cyborg soldiers. For reference, the first anime series opened up at around the halfway point, 
and a second at the tail end of the manga storyline. So, in watching the 2001 version of the series, it creates the sensation that you received the full Cyborg 009 story. Even with the omission of the origin plot lines, the 2001 edition exchanged it for something more worthwhile, a sense of immersion for the audience, as you as a viewer begin the series not knowing what is going on, while a hazy 009 awakens in a strange laboratory hearing an unfamiliar voice in his head, 001. So the similar experiences make it feel like you're unraveling a mystery alongside the main character. This version's opening excelled in another manner, as it firmly established everything necessary within the first few episodes. The main team alongside their powers, all of which got put on display immediately. In addition to that, a goal and an enemy to combat. So it felt like the protagonist had a purpose, and that everything led up to something greater. I will say, the beginning of the series contained some weaknesses, forgivable ones though, such as the viewpoint focusing too heavily on 009 rather than the team as a whole. But strictly speaking, as he classifies as the main character, the story has to hone in on him before branching off to everyone else. So I accept this inclusion as a necessary evil to lay a good foundation. The other weak point of the opening regards how it exhibited cliched scenes like we need to learn to work together for going to function as a team, which again I view as awkward but acknowledge that the story somewhat requires it since these characters just began their journey. I will say both these issues get ironed out as the plot progresses. One of my biggest complaints regarding the 2001 anime involved how it seemed toned down, especially when compared to the other entries of the franchise. In fact, numerous cases of plot overlap occur between this and the earlier adaptations, which makes it all the more apparent. Two such examples include Kubi Kuro, the cyborg dog who sought revenge against mankind, and the relationship between 001 and his father Gamma Whiskey, both of which cases severely watered down the subject of experimentation on living things, with the latter also omitting Gamma's slaying of his wife. Cyborg 009-2001 adopting a more family-friendly attitude doesn't necessarily break this story, but it does feel diluted because of it. To me, what best embodies this approach would be how its script rewrote 004 from being a cold mechanical killer to a man struggling with his humanity. As even though one may try to argue it made him more deeper as a character, in reality, it stripped him of his personality, what made him unique, and just reduced him to being another member of the team. So I think this version of Cyborg 009 lost a bit of its mechanical charm, and exchanged it for sentimentality. On that note, throughout this version's story, 002 commonly switched roles with 004. Like in the previously mentioned Cosmic Child arc, I said 002 encouraged a young alien to face his oppressors. Well, in the manga, 004 instead assumed this role. So this interpretation changed the context from its original meaning, from a cold-hearted message of fight back to a warmer stand up for yourself. Another major alteration between this and the manga would be reimagining the story to have occurred in the present era instead of the 60s. One noticeable instance involved rewriting an arc that occurred during the Vietnam War to a modern day civil war in Africa, which, in the overall plot of the story, better utilized 008 as a character, while still accomplishing the same tasks as its manga counterpart. Despite this radical change, the story handled this contemporary take rather well. Like in a certain sense, this also prevented a feeling of the series coming across as dated, as the Vietnam War associates with the 60s, whereas a generic civil war can be applied to any era and rub off as relevant to the times. In all fairness, this modernization forced some suspension of belief moments. Like to allow 004's backstory to have occurred and remain set in the modern time, the Black Ghost organization for some reason or another froze members 1 through 4 for 40 years, which does come across as awkward, but the story had fun with this concept. Like, some characters joked about 009 going out with an old woman in 003. So even though this alteration might not be perfect, it came nowhere near close to failing. One of the most praiseworthy aspects of the 2001 anime revolved around how it rearranged the manga's arcs to make everything fit, or better put, its structuring. Like, the manga magnificently ended the Black Ghost Saga, basically part one of the comic, or just the first 50 out of 100 plus chapters. But how it left everything off made continuing the story an awkward and difficult task. So much so, that when part 2 released, it picked up like nothing had happened, and never revealed how, let's just say, everyone made it out alive. In saying that, Cyborg 009-2001 retained a thrilling conclusion of part 1, while also managing to tell quite a number of tales from the later parts of the manga, which included the City of Wind, by moving the defeat of the Black Ghost back to the very end of the timeline, so this version restructuring the placement of arcs could depict the best aspects from both sides of the story, without lessening the past. Since I just mentioned the City of Wind, I'll use that as an example for why I say the 2001 anime adapted the original manga in a more comprehensible and to a certain extent even improved way. 
First off, the animated version clearly stated what triggered the reappearance of the pyramid, which stemmed from a gust of wind brushing up against a specific formation of rocks. Whereas in the manga, it never revealed the exact key, and you have to read into the illustration to even guess on why that occurred. And even then, that could be a misinterpretation, or overreading a random coincidence. So the anime's exposition rewrote this narrative as more digestible, as it fleshed out the inner workings of the environment and how it improved upon the story regard an extra detail it added, which involved giving the priestess a regeneration ability. So after tanking the blow intended for 009, she survived the ordeal, but due to the destruction of the formation of rocks, the key, she got permanently locked out of the plane of existence she desired to join for eternity. So I find the anime's version of this arc superior, as this indirect censorship unintentionally adds a greater level of ironic existential suffering, as it created a fate worse than death, that'll burn deeper into your mind than how it originally happened in the manga. To conclude the discussion on Cyborg 009-2001, I have to say, of all the major adaptations of the franchise, this one provides the most genuine experience of Shotaro Ishinomori's vision, and for the most part, best captures the essence of the original work. Yes, at times it may not perfectly sync up in spirit or story, but when it doesn't, it usually benefits from it in the long run. On to my favorite entry in the franchise, the 1979 anime. First off, I see this iteration as the culmination of what the other two major series did right, minus most of their respective negatives. It possessed a great continuous in a single episode stories of the 68 series, and it strongly established a team and their abilities early on, like the later 2001 adaptation. Unlike the other versions, the 1979 anime carried itself with a mature demeanor. It lacked the overt comedic treatment from the 1960s version, and it never watered anything down or relied too heavily on sentimentality as the 2000 series would go on to do. Its more adult tone went beyond what it didn't do, but also included what it was willing to depict. Such as towards the end of the series when a giant robot ripped off 002's arm, or when 004 had to strike down an innocent to save the team. Great atmospheric imagery consistently appeared throughout this adaptation's run. The death of Odin, Professor Galton's fusion with the Easter Island, a mad scientist attempting to transplant the brain of Hitler into a robot, or the cultish aesthetic of the neo-black ghost chambers. Even the opening scene left a memorable atmospheric impression, where 001 suffered a chilling premonition about the fate of the world, unconsciously causing him to, in a paranormal-like manner, levitate up every single object in the surrounding room. In mentioning the series opening, I'll continue on with that. Now this version hit the ground running in its debut episode, where all the characters' introductions excellently establish their abilities, personalities, and who they are. 002 Racing 009, which displays the former's competitiveness and the latter's suave demeanor. 003's gracefulness as she performs the dance of a ballerina, or 005's ruggedness as in a scene akin to an old-fashioned western, bid farewell to his ranch, donned his cowboy hat, and walked off into the sunset. The same applies to the first use of their powers, too. 001 Psychic Fuel Predictions, 008 Cliff Diving into the Sea, 005 Blocking an in-motion mountain-sized stomp from a stone giant, or 007 Transforming into an Eagle to pick up 006 to blow his flames at the previously mentioned giant. Not to mention the team's arrival to the battlefield to aid 009, which featured them in a cool demeanor lined up atop a cliff. Even though the 79 anime started at a later point of the series, the Edda arc to be exact, it never felt purposeless like the 68 adaptation, as immediately the plot sent the team in the direction of fighting the Norse gods. So even if the story followed an episodic formula, it still felt like the team chased a greater goal than facing what's right in front of them at the moment, as a central antagonist linked these episodic narratives together. On another note, since this iteration began late in the overall story of Cyborg 009, it never fell victim to the we-need-to-learn-to-work-together-as-a-team cliché which actually provided this series a superior luxury in the end, as because the crew knew their powers in each other, when they participated in combat, it really felt like watching a team of experts at play. So right from the start, it possessed a confidence and coolness factor that could not have occurred through rookies. At the same time, it also circumnavigated a problem facing many adaptations that don't start at the exact beginning of their basises, which could leave a sensation that a chunk of the story had been left out. Well, Cyborg 00979 dodged this issue by saying that the team had long since separated and gone their own ways, but due to 001's ill-fated prediction, they once again have to reunite to overcome a new foe. So the series structured its plot in such a way that it could function on its own without requiring knowledge of the first half, as just knowing that the protagonist used to serve on a team together suffices. Since their current selves, along with their new enemies, exist as their own independent narratives unrelated to the past. I'll say this though, this interpretation of the Edda arc definitely dumbed down the manga's version by removing most of its philosophic content in favor of fighting an antagonistic group more akin to the Miso cyborgs. In saying that though, 
I hardly believe this damaged the anime, especially from a practical standpoint. Let me put it like this. If you know how to read in between the lines, you'll find gold in the manga's version of the Edda arc. But if you can't, you'll most likely see it as pretentious, confusing, and unengaging. So the animated series rewrote it in a more consumable manner. And even if it doesn't contain as much depth, it still presented some original ideas to reflect on. After saying that, now would be as good a time as any to say, story-wise, this version least resembles the manga. But since it strayed so far from the source, it doesn't fall into the category of a lesser, disfigured adaptation, and instead becomes its own thing following its own rules. At the same time, it implemented some of the finest aspects of the manga into its construction, so it still possessed a solid foundation to build off of, while also having the luxury to take it any direction it wanted to. For instance, in the original manga, 002's backstory consisted of only a few panels, involving him accidentally stabbing a rival gang leader and subsequently getting abducted by the Black Ghost organization. By the way, that chapter also covered members 3 through 8, meaning even less time devoted to him. But the 1979 anime fleshed that out into an entire episode, which expanded upon his childhood, his relationship with his former clique, introduced a blood transfusion incident, and all that culminated in what I consider to be his best moment across the entire franchise, where he rejected a plea for help to hide his dirty mechanical secret. Meaning it better intertwined his backstory into the present timeline, so it turned what would have been a few minutes in the manga into a decade plus in the anime. Overall, the manga laid a foundation and the anime built a skyscraper out of it. Elaborating on that, in general, I find that this adaptation best utilized the protagonist's abilities, and I would go so far to say that I view these iterations of the characters as their most well-conceived versions. For instance, in the other series, 005 on the battlefield usually just throws tanks around, but here, he quite often has a tangle with humanoid foes of equal strengths to himself, making these battles more distinct and memorable than even his canonical ones. Regarding the latter half of that statement, when I think of what would be my favorite moment for each cyborg soldier, they almost always originate from the 79 series. 002 refusing to donate blood, 004 assuming the role of the crew's killer so no one else would have to sully themselves, or again, 005 blocking the giant stomp. So even though this series may not have the overarching or canonical plot, it still contains some of the finest moments throughout the entire franchise. Getting back on track, as this anime didn't try to perfectly adapt the manga panel by panel, page by page, it didn't have to let great characters go to waste just because the series started later in the overall timeline of Cyborg 009. Like this adaptation wrote to early manga characters of 0011 and 0013 to its story, who canonically had long since perished by the time of the Edda arc. So because the 79 anime didn't abide by the structure of the manga, it could actually cover more material than if it followed everything correctly. By the way, just because they occurred at a different point in the story doesn't lessen them or their effects as characters. In fact, this portrayal of 0013 more accurately depicted his person from what he was in the original manga than the technically more correct to the canon 2001 series. As in this version and the manga, he had difficulty communicating with others, whereas in the later series he held full conversations. Moving on to what would be considered the biggest flaw of the 1979 anime, involving its abrupt ending. Now, as an episode itself, this would not be seen as bad, but as a conclusion, it left much to be desired, as towards the end, the story introduced several intriguing aspects that went unresolved, like a mysterious figure who presented himself as a resurrected Odin came into the picture, but never really did anything, and also Gamma Whiskey started to fulfill a more significant role in the story, like helping a few enemies, briefly encountering his son, but he never experienced a big, center stage moment. Thus meaning, as a character, he felt unsatisfying. So both of these two left the impression the story was leading up to something bigger, but unfortunately, the run ended before it could be addressed. To sum up the second televised entry in the Cyborg 009 franchise, even though it may not have perfectly adapted its source material, it took the best elements from it and created new stories and scenarios that could rival or, dare I say, even surpass its basis. To conclude this video, I have to say I see Cyborg 009 as a love letter to science fiction, especially works from the 50s and 60s. Robots, super weapons, space travel, UFOs, aliens, dinosaurs, time travel, people from the future, mutations, experiments gone wrong, and the underground empire of the Yomi Arc, the team traveled 20,000 leagues beneath the sea. In saying all that though, because the series existed to honor its influences, I think it remains a product of its time, in more ways than one if you get my drift. And in all honesty, I believe the two later anime adaptations surpass it as a work. But I only see that as true for the more surface level, or should I say, skin deep aspects. As at its core, I believe Cyborg 009 laid out an unaging blueprint on how to construct a story and manage a large cast or team. That I think these newer series who greatly emphasize crew, squads, classes, or guilds over singular protagonists could learn a lot from. Hence why I say Cyborg 009, the most well-balanced team of shonen superheroes. Thanks for watching this video, hopefully you all enjoy it. Feel free to tell me your favorite Cyborg soldier in the comments below. Again, thanks for watching.